Hello. We're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Vitamin D Metabolites and Clinical Re Revelance. I am Kristen Pregentiel of LabRoots, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is pre presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning made possible by an open education grant from Agilent Technologies. Agilent Technologies has, no in, has had no input in the selection of speakers, content, or mode of presentation. Let's get started. You can pose questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the Q&A box, which will open when you click the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left hand corner of your web page and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Ravinder Singh. Dr. Ravinder Singh is the director of the Mayo Clinic Endocrine Laboratory. He has a focused area of investigation that has broad applicability to the field. Dr. Singh studies the application of liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry to clinical laboratory analysis. Many of the methods that Dr. Singh developed are now considered reference methods. They have subsequently been utilized for method standardization efforts as well as to establish clinical disease correlates, which he has published with his collaborators. Dr. Singh's work has directly contributed to improving methods for the clinical diagnosis of Cushing's disease, pheochromocytoma, and congenital adrenal hyperplasia. He continues to work to discover innovative ways to better understand the uses of LCMS and MS in providing patients with faster and more accurate diagnoses. Dr. Singh will now begin his presentation. On the internet, and thanks everyone for joining as well. The topic today I'm going to talk to you today is uh, what vitamin D metabolites clinical relevance. I just have one disclosure that I work for Mayo Medical Laboratories, which is for profit arm of the overall nonprofit organization Mayo Clinic. So we will have three learning objectives today. <clears throat> the first objective would be that we will discuss a case of records, which will also highlight the complexity of the vitamin D endocrine system. Second objective of the talk will be what are the various issues related to the vitamin D testing in the clinical laboratories? And I would like to finish with what is the clinical lab's role in differential diagnosis of hypercalcemia and vitamin D toxicity? Let's start with the case of rickets in a premature infant. This particular infant was born through the C-section. Mother came for a routine checkup and during the routine checkup, on ultrasound, it was found that the fetus had growth retardation and there was an abnormal umbilical blood flow to the fetus. And the decision was made to have a uh, premature C-section for the delivery of the baby. When the baby was born, baby's neurological functions were not perfect and the APCO score was only six to seven when the perfect score is 10. Infant was given a uh, drug called Serventa to help in breathing. For various clinical reasons, the infant was also admitted to the new little intensive care unit for medical management. One of the challenges in the intensive care units for the interns who were attending this particular child was that the ionized calcium was going up or down as some interventions were done. When the calcium was low, physicians uh, infused calcium, but then it went above the normal range. Then they hydrated the child, then it went below. It was very difficult to bring calcium uh, into the normal range until uh, a few months later they figured out the cause 
and then the calcium was normalized. This picture shows the x-ray picture when this baby was taken to the radiology to make sure that baby's feeding line, breathing line, and other lines which were necessary in the intensive care unit were in place and they were not misplaced. During that observation, the physician noticed that there was a weakening of the bones or rickets present in this particular child. Without wasting any time, clinicians quickly started supplementation of this child with a vitamin D. And child was given 2,000 international unit vitamin D in the form of algo calciferol. Child was also given uh, single special care, which contains a uh, good amount of calcium and also some amount of vitamin D3. This particular slide highlights that vitamin D mainly comes from yeast uh, present in mushrooms and um, the D2 is mainly the plant form of the uh, vitamin. But vitamin D2, like D3, will go through the liver and get converted to 25 hydroxy vitamin D on a need basis, 125-dihydroxy vitamin D will be formed by an enzyme 1-alpha-hydroxylate, which is mostly present in the kidney. This slide shows the mammalian form of the vitamin D, which is called vitamin D3. Most of the humans get vitamin D3 by exposure to the sunlight. But in some parts of the world, uh, people do supplement by taking through the diet as well. D2 or D3 follow the same path by getting converted to 25 hydroxy vitamin D2 or D3. And then either 25 hydroxy vitamin D2 or D3 will be converted to 125 dihydroxy vitamin D through the kidney by using one alpha hydroxylase. After the supplementation of this infant with the 2,000 unit of albucalciferol, <clears throat> it was obvious that the vitamin D levels in this infant were above the normal limit, and it went up to 120 nanogram per ml. Physicians got concerned, and they stopped the supplementation. And as you can see with the green light in 2000, December, the, the results started coming down. So the assay we use in our lab is called liquid chromatographic tendon mass pad, which allows us to look at the, the total results into two, shape, two uh, forms. The red is shown as 25 hydroxy vitamin D3, and the blue is shown 25 hydroxy D2. As we know, this particular child was getting D2, and the red is D2, that was went high when it was stopped and it started coming down, and the D3 was continued to take care of this particular child. As soon as the intervention was made with the vitamin D, there was no issue in the calcium regulation for this child. When this child had a low 25 hydroxy vitamin D, the 125-dihydroxy vitamin D levels in this child were high. But when the calcium got normalized, the 25 hydroxy got normalized, the 125 also decreased and came into the normal range, and so was PTH and bone alkaline phosphatase. Unfortunately, because of the premature delay of this child and other uh, neurological disability, the child um, did not have a good outcome. The question clinically and from the lab perspective is that was the rickets preventable in this particular baby? Let's look at the mother's history. Mother is 25 years old, gravid of four, three successful pregnancies. Mother had a history of chronic hypertension due to polycystic kidney disease. She had the previous preeclampsia as well, and she was smoker during the last pregnancy and liver history of depression, and she was a carrier of cystic fibrosis. When the radiologists looked at this particular image, they were surprised to see that there were a lot of cysts in the liver and a lot of cysts in the kidney, and kidneys were enlarged 
And this helped in explaining what was the cause of rickett in this child. This also shows now that during the last pregnancy, mother's renal function was not optimal and her creatinine were high than the normal range, as you can see, highlighted to the red arrow. So putting all this together, the vitamin D endocrine system is very complex, and when the calcium levels are low, there is a receptor at the parathyroid gland, which is called calcium sensing receptor. The parathyroid gland will make PTH, and PTH will help in resolving calcium from the bone to normalize the calcium in the circulation. PTH will also help in converting 25-hydroxy vitamin D to 125-dihydroxy vitamin D by overexpressing 1-alpha-hydroxylase. 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, which is the bioactive form of the vitamin D, will interact with the vitamin D receptor at the intestine and will help in absorbing calcium and phosphorus and as will correct in calcium absorption. So all this is complex mechanism where vitamin D is controlled through calcium and then PTH also has a significant role in this pathway. As you noticed, this particular case, mother who had a polycystic kidney disease and had so the treatment in this mother would have been not what you and me get from our grocery stores, which is a very cheap form of vitamin D, which is called agrocalcifer or polycalcifer. Neither this mom would have uh, benefited uh, uh, from other, you know, polycalcifer or other any kind of supplementation, except that this mother would have benefited by the active form, which is listed down here, active vitamin D sterols, and their names are calcitriol, maxicalcitriol, and paracalcitriol. And then these drugs are very expensive compared to what we buy from the grocery stores. So in most of the population, the supplementation with vitamin D2 and D3 is sufficient. But in a rare situation like this case, mother would have required calcitriol. Rickett is a disease of the bones. What this slide shows is that on my left, the child has rickets, and we tested vitamin D level in this child, and vitamin D 25 hydroxy levels were normal in this child. But when we gave this particular child the calcium, that took care of the rickets. So the message in this slide is 25 hydroxy vitamin D or 125 dihydroxy vitamin D are the messenger molecules in helping the absorption of the calcium, but it is a calcium which helps in strengthening the bones. I would like to now go to the second objective for the talk. What are the various issues related to the vitamin D testing? The vitamin D testing is very popular. As you can see it here, it is in the media everywhere. And a lot of companies are interested and bringing new supplements to the market. And uh, uh, like this particular news says, half of the Americans are using supplements. And vitamin D comes in the form of D3 or the D2. So that means our clinical laboratories have to make sure when we do the testing in humans uh, for their patient care or to know the storage of the vitamin D, the, our assays should pick up both D3 and D2. This slide further reminds here that what is the difference between D2 and D3. D2 has this extra methyl group and then this uh, unsaturated bond versus that is absent in the D3. Otherwise, most of the structure between the two is very similar. Vitamin D goes to very active metabolism and is quickly uh, converted to various metabolites. And we cannot uh, measure all of those into the clinical lab because some of the relevance of those metabolites is not well established and there's no clinical value. So most of the time, 
if you are interested in knowing the vitamin D storage and vitamin D levels in the patient, 25 hydroxy vitamin D is the optimal test, and that is the only test should be ordered, and none of the other ones listed on this slide. The gold standard method for vitamin D testing right from the beginning has been HPLC UV chromatogram example is shown here. And one of the disadvantages of this method is this is very laborious and requires very long chromatography to separate out 25 hydroxy from the possible interferences it can have. The modern labs now can afford HPLC combined with the tandem mass spectrometry. And that's the example shown here. This assay is less laborious and it has a rapid turnaround time and does allow you to give two separate signals, one for D3 and D2, and they can be combined into the patient report if the total is desired by the clinician. And the runtime is also less than what you saw in the previous FPLC method. Fortunately, the comparison between the HPLC method and LC10 and mass spec method is very good because both of these methods do require extraction from the serum and release of the vitamin D from the binding protein. And that is the key for a good method that we need to remove the interferences and we need to release the vitamin D from the binding protein. This slide shows that method comparison is good for both 25 hydroxy vitamin D2 as well as D3. LC mass specs are very cumbersome instruments. They do take a lot of space. And this particular slide shows that you need pumps, you need auto samplers, you need mass spec to make this happen. And this is the picture how our lab is organized to accommodate various mass specs for testing of vitamin D and other steroids and hormones. This testing does require solvent and does generate a lot of wastage. In comparison, most of the clinical labs have automated uh, instrumentation to perform a lot of clinical testing by using automated analyzers. They are highly automated, they are less laborious, and they're very popular instruments in most of the local hospital labs. So it will become clear as we go deep into what was the advantage of liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry over the amino acids. There are two types of amino acids, at least, which I'm going to talk about in this talk. One is called sandwich amino acids, which is very commonly used for the large molecule weight proteins. And this has really revolutionized the patient care in the clinical lab because we have a very good sensitivity and specificity when we use sandwich amino acids. In comparison, for small molecular weight like vitamin D and other steroids and drugs, we cannot use sandwich approach. So we cannot use two antibodies. We have to rely upon a single antibody and then we have to rely upon the competition with the label tracer, which is highlighted here with a yellow uh, star here. Because of the design and the technology, there is an inverse uh, relationship between the signal and the concentration, as is highlighted on my right-hand side. And as you can notice that the signal change at the low end is very little, and the signal change is not much at the high end. So the precision is far from perfect at the low end and high end of the amino acids for the small molecular weight, which are also called competitive amino acids. There is a very small dynamic range where these acids are applicable. That's another limitation. And because we are using single antibody, our specificity could also be low, that this antibody could cross-react with more vitamin D metabolites. If you remember, we in this case, we want an antibody which should cross-react with vitamin D2 and D3. So there are a lot of commercial amino acids available in the market, which are highly automated, and some of their characteristics are listed in this slide here. 
What is highlighted in the red circle is the specificity of the antibody used in this amino assays. In the first assay listed in the top is that antibody has a cross reactivity with the D2 up to 52%. The second ISIS antibody has a cross reactivity for D2 and D3 in the same 100% range. Diasorin antibody right from the beginning, whether it was in the form of radio amino assay or the ultimate liaison, had always had 100% cross reactivity with D2 and D3. Some of the other manufacturers at one time had no cross reactivity with the D2, but that has been corrected now. So most of the assays which we find in the commercial labs now have equal cross reactivity with D2 and D3. And by design, HPLC methods and LC methods listed at the end of the bottom of the slide, you can uh, set up your chromatography in the mass pack to look for both D2 and D3 into the analysis. This is a difficult slide to understand, but this is called bland alt and plot between the two assays. And a perfect match between the two assays, if we were comparing amino assay with the gold standard liquid chromatography 10 in SPAC or HPLC, then the solid line should be at zero and all those open circles should be right on the zero, not have as much deviation as you see in this slide. So the conclusion in this slide here is that if the LC MSMS is the gold standard compared to that, this particular amino assay has a lot of variability which cannot be predicted. In some patients, you will have over recovery, and in some patients, you will have underestimation. And that may not be the optimum for the best patient care. There's a lot of literature which has been published comparing various amino acids with the gold standard 10 mass spectrometry, and this is one of those papers highlighted on this slide. This particular paper concluded that based upon what assay is used, we can reach different conclusions for the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency in your population. For example, the black line is showing, which is the HPLC method, that at 50 nanomoles or below, there is approximately 10% of the population which will be below 50 nanomoles. But if the same population is tested by the radio amino acid, then the conclusion will be almost 21, 22% of the population will be below 50 nanomoles. And if we use the automated analyzer assay, then our conclusion will be that we will be overestimating the vitamin D deficiency in the general population. So the best case scenario will be that all those three lines are on the top of each other so that we don't have any variations and confusion among the patients and the physicians. The last objective for this presentation is how can clinical lab help a physician in uh, differentiating hypercalcemia due to vitamin D toxicity or other possible causes? I'm going to uh, mention this case, which is a different case now. This particular child was brought to the Mayo Clinic from a neighboring city, and this baby was not thriving well. Baby was vomiting, and baby's calcium was very high. Calcium was 18, and then it was going back and forth between 15.5, 15.4, and the phosphorus was on the low side. The PTH was suppressed less than six, and on ultrasound, there was indication of nephrocalcinosis for this child. On probing the history of this child, this particular child was being breastfed, and mother was giving some uh, medicine in the homeopathic group of medicines, and mother was also giving some warm up some form of vitamin D also, and she could not remember the brand of the vitamin D at that time. Because the calcium was high and mother was giving some kind of vitamin D, there was a concern that maybe this particular child has a vitamin D toxicity, but the confusion was, it is known in the literature, especially in the adults, that 
if the calcium is high due to vitamin D toxicity, then the phosphorus should also be high, which was not observed in this child. So that was a little exception to the rule. So in order to take care of this patient, our physicians uh, admitted this patient into emergency. And this patient was treated with a drug which is not approved for adults, calcitonin, which helped this patient to bring the calcium down to the normal range. But as soon as the baby was discharged from the hospital, which is a St. Mary's Hospital in Rochester, Minnesota, calcium was also trending high again. The baby was admitted again into the hospital to make sure that hypercalcemia is controlled. The baby was treated with another drug, which is hamidronate. So the, as the baby was being managed clinically and being taken care, we ended up running this particular blood sample from this child, and to everyone's surprise, the vitamin D level in this child was close to 300 nanograms per ml, which was definitely in the toxicity range, and that explained the hypercalcemia in this child. As you can notice here, because that supplementation was stopped, but even then it took 40 days for this in the white line for 25 hydroxy vitamin D to come down from 300 to in the range of 70 to 100 nanograms per ml. And the normal is good up to 20 to 30 nanograms per ml. So what led to this toxicity in this particular child? We tested mother's blood and it was good to confirm that mother's calcium, potassium, and creatinine are in the normal range. Mother's vitamin D was also normal. So that could not explain high vitamin D levels in this particular child, even though we know that this baby was being breastfed as well, but because mom doesn't have high, so there was no way that vitamin D was going from mom into the child. So for the probing with the mother, mother did say that she has been given supplemental vitamin D and we told her to bring that supplement um, to the clinic and we looked at that and mom was thinking that she was giving maybe a drop and it should be in the range of 100 units on a daily basis. So this particular, what you see on the slide was the source of vitamin D where this mom mother was purchasing and was giving uh, to this particular child. When we tested the vitamin D content of this particular supplement, we were surprised that instead of containing 2,000 international units as was on the label, it contained 6,000 international units in one drop. And mother started admitting also that instead of a drop, maybe once in a while she was giving a full dropper as well. If you calculate the total amount of the dose this particular child may have been getting, that may be approximately in the range of 50,000 international units for two months. And that is what led to the crisis in this particular child. Mother has stopped giving supplementation. And now this particular young girl is doing well according to the physician and baby is growing back. Vitamin D toxicity is not limited to the children. This particular slide shows in another patient we had where vitamin D was in the range of 300 nanogram per ml. And this particular vitamin D did not came down to the normal range even in one year. So we took the biopsy of this patient. We were surprised to find that the fat in this particular patient contained a lot of vitamin D in the storage. So vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin and it loves to sit in the fat and that is what was going on in this patient. So vitamin D is available in various shapes and forms and the patient we just talked about adult liked the chocolates but then he found a particular chocolate which contained very high doses of vitamin D and that has led to the crisis in the adult as well. So there's a caution there that there will be 
vitamin D in more supplements, and you may have to watch the dose which is prescribed or recommended by your physician. In summary, vitamin D is a very complex endocrine system. Vitamin D, like any other drug, goes through various enzymatic processes. So if we kind of go through it, vitamin D will get converted to 25-hydroxy vitamin D by the liver enzymes 25-hydroxylase, and then 25-hydroxylase or the 25-hydroxy vitamin D will get converted to 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. But when there is a no need for 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, the excess of 25 and 125 gets inactivated by the enzyme 24-hydroxylase to the inactive forms. But if there are patients in the general population which don't have this enzyme, which is 24-hydroxylase, they are also prone to developing hypercalcemia. So I would like to thank you for your attention, and I will happy to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh, for your presentation. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them into the Q&A box found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Dr. Singh will answer as many questions as time permits. The first question we have is how common is rickets? I'll bring the question up. So the rickets is an ancient disease, and in the modern um, developed world, there's a lot of supplementation in our bread, food, and milk. So we should not see cases of rickets. And the case which I presented to you was a very rare form of rickets which happened because a mother had a polycystic kidney disease. So fortunately in US, we should not expect many cases of rickets. And the same should be true in other developing countries. And most of the developing countries have realized and there's enough supplementation going on. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Our next question we have, what is the gold standard method for 25-hydroxy vitamin D testing? Dr. Hector DeLuca is considered one of the pioneers in vitamin D research. Right from the beginning, he knew that vitamin D had many metabolites and he believed in extracting the sample serum or plasma and then performing the assays either by HPLC or the binding proteins of the amino acids. So the gold standard will be that any technology which offers the extraction plus the chromatography or LCMSMS because that increases your specificity so that the chances of having cross-reactivity are lower and lower. So the gold standard today would be liquid chromatography and a mass spectrometry method for 25-hydroxy vitamin D. And fortunately, our CDC in USA has a reference method, which was also developed by NIST in US. And we as a clinical labs and the vendors should take advantage of the effort they have put into standardizing our assets. Thank you. Interesting. What is the mechanism of vitamin D toxicity? Uh, difficult question here. Uh, uh, one of the mechanisms would be that if there is over uh, dose of vitamin D level, and then our body has to get rid of the excess vitamin D. And then one of the mechanisms is that 
121 hydroxylase is going to convert into 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. And any excess of 125 dihydroxy vitamin D is going to absorb calcium from the diet, which normally we absorb very small percentage. Most of it goes to the waste, but when we have an excess of 125 dihydroxy vitamin D in circulation because of the vitamin D um, in our storage, that could be one of the reasons for developing uh, hypercalcemia or the vitamin D toxicity. Great, thank you. If there are no more questions, I would like to once again thank Dr. Singh for his presentation. Do you have any final comments, Dr. Singh? and all everyone who was able to join us today. This is a topic which is interesting to a lot of patients. And the more we could understand the physiology and the mechanism of how vitamin D works, we will be able to serve our patients, our populations in a more educated way. So one should look at the literature, what are the various differences and various methods and what is going to be the best method for vitamin D testing for the better patient care. Thank you. I'd like to also thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. We would also like to thank our educational sponsor, Agilent Technologies, for today's webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through November of 2017. Lab Roots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.